we're referring to two things. First of all, uh, there are new sanction measures uh, imposed by U.S. government on China. And second, uh, the electronic design automation uh, chips, the EDA chips, that is the uh, instrument for chip uh, manufacturing. The third, uh, the U.S. talents cannot work in China. And the fourth, the equipment for manufacturing chips more advanced than 14 nanometers. Global supply chain is uh, very vulnerable, uh, so we have to increase the resilience. The second, most importantly, is the geopolitical competition, or, or let's say big power rivalry between U.S. and China. This uh, chip war, uh, like it or not, is existential. Taiwan has been um, the center of uh, semiconductor manufacturing, especially uh, the, the advanced ones. Uh, Taiwan provides more than 90% of the advanced chips. Taiwan has, has developed, like China, a very comprehensive uh, supply chain and ecosystem, uh, including uh, very good ICT manufacturing. Taiwanese government and companies uh, are involved uh, and has the willingness uh, uh, to be collaborative with uh, the Indian partners. Semiconductor industry, as I said, does not exist alone. It exists in the ecosystem. Hi, welcome to the Raisina Idea Spot, Dr. Shu. Uh, my name is Raji Rajgopalan, and I'm truly delighted to have Dr. Shu with us this morning uh, to discuss one of the hottest topics, chips war, and what do we do about it? Uh, Dr. Shu Chen Shu is board member of the Institute of National Res Defense and Security Research, Taiwan. Welcome, and I want to start with one of the broad questions. Why has semiconductors become such a hot, hot topic in terms of both geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, from that angle? Uh, do you think there is a chip war going on? And what role do you perceive uh, Taiwan to play in, the, in this particular chip war that we are seeing already playing out? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, regarding the, uh, this term chip war, of course, there's a, a book coming. Um, but I would say uh, <clears throat> there are two levels of this issue. One, of course, when we talk about chip war, usually we're referring to um, the uh, strategic competition between U.S. and China mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, its uh, ramification on the semiconductor uh, or other uh, advanced technology. So that's one level. But on the other level, let's not forget uh, there is always uh, commercial competition between companies and between countries. Uh, and these two levels uh, coexist and uh, interact with each other. So that's a, a big background. Um, why do we have a, a chip war? Uh, when we talk about chip war, I think there, we're referring to two things. First of all, uh, there are new sanction measures uh, imposed by U.S. government on China, on China's uh, semiconductor. Namely, uh, there are the following things. First of all, uh, the uh, banning on the advanced uh, computing chips uh, exported uh, to China. And second, uh, the electronic design automation uh, chips, the EDA chips, that is the uh, instrument for chip uh, manufacturing, more advanced than three nanometers. The third, uh, the U.S. talents cannot work in China. And the fourth, the equipment for manufacturing chips more advanced than 14 nanometers. These are the sanction uh, measures. Uh, so this is one part. But the second part is during COVID-19, uh, the whole world uh, witnessed uh, a supply chain uh, bottleneck or short shortage of supply. Uh, but that's not only resulted from China. This, this is a global phenomenon. So uh, there is this need for uh, US to draw back you know, some of the manufacturing uh, to US uh, soil. And so we add these two things together, and we have what we call cheap war. Uh, that's a result uh, uh, of two things. First of all, uh, the awareness that the global supply chain is uh, very vulnerable, uh, so we have to increase the resilience. The second, most importantly, is the geopolitical competition or, or let's say, big power rivalry between U.S. and China. Uh, so that's the reason. 
As for Taiwan, uh, we even before we have this, Taiwan has been um, the center of uh, semiconductor manufacturing, especially uh, the, the advanced ones. Uh, Taiwan provides more than 90% of the advanced chips and 60% of the regular chip manufacturing. Uh, so it is uh, very important uh, globally. And we shall keep doing that, maintain that position, uh, meaning two things. First of all, uh, being resilient and adaptive to uh, the cheap war. And second, uh, uh, maintain our advantage in the business competition. Terrific. And I'm going to come back to you on the U.S. export control measures. Uh, but I have one more, another broad question. Um, what do you see, how do you see the landscape of the semiconductor industry uh, in the, if you were to look at it in a 30-year uh, time frame? Um, uh, but even maybe you can start with a 5 to 10-year frame time frame. How does that semiconductor um, uh, industry landscape look like? Who do you think are going to be the major players in this regard? Uh, what is likely to be the broad trends in terms of cooperation, partnerships, and, of course, conflict? Mm. Well, <clears throat> um, despite the fact that we um, have a, a competition and a, a chip war, uh, the, the demand for chips actually uh, is increasing, and we don't see the limits. Um, right now, we are stepping into... Uh, in terms of technology, a new new age, that is the uh, more application of AI and uh, 5G. If you put the two, these two things together, uh, the impact will penetrate almost every dimension of our life. Uh, for example, trans transportation uh, and uh, education, uh, medical services, agriculture, or government. Uh, on every aspect, um, the application of AI and 5G has just started. So uh, we don't see limits uh, in developments in all dimensions, and uh, therefore we, we see great future uh, for advanced uh, chip manufacturing. Um, and uh, whether, uh, uh, who will be the major players? Uh, the uh, semiconductor uh, has never been dominated by one or two country or one or two companies. It's always a pluralistic ecosystem, uh, locally and globally. Uh, we think it will still be the same way. Uh, for example, U.S. and Europe uh, will always uh, st will still drive and lead the technological innovation. In Asian countries will still play critical roles in supply chain and in, manu and in manufacturing. Um, um, and uh, uh, Europe, European countries and the Japanese com companies, uh, they are providing uh, critical equipments and their other countries provide the materials. Uh, so this is always a multilateral, multinational collaboration. We think will be uh, still the, the, this way. Um, so uh, the best thing we should do every country is to find a niche uh, for itself and to develop a uh, strategy accordingly. So it is still a U.S. and U.S. allied sort of an effort in mainly. Uh, in that scene, where do you see China coming up uh, in the coming years? Because uh, obviously they have been putting a lot of money um, to strengthen their uh, semiconductor base within the country. And they must have expected the U.S. to come up with these kind of tough measures on them. So they must have been preparing for this eventuality in a sense. So where do you think China is going to go uh, in the coming, in the maybe five to ten years? Where do you see them in terms of the semiconductor manufacturing abilities? Yes. Um, uh, I mentioned about um, the contents of uh, sanction measures uh, imposed on China. These are focusing on advanced manufacturing, advanced chips, not the mature manufacturing uh, uh, chips uh, or regular ones. China is still important in those uh, mature nodes uh, and the manufacturing. Uh, China has been developing a semiconductor industry for 20 years. Uh, they have achieved a lot. We should never underestimate uh, their potential and their determination. Of course, um, 
the U.S. sanction to some extent will pull back and slow down uh, China's uh, endeavor in the advanced manufacturing. Uh, but other than that, uh, I don't think there is a major decoupling yet, uh, uh, not between U.S. and China, nor between uh, China and the rest of the world. Um, however, I must say uh, some of the uh, some of the application companies, like Apple or other companies, they have gradually moved uh, the supply chain out of China, uh, probably against the background of geopolitical risks, uh, diversify their manufacturing to other parts of the world, including uh, Southeast Asia, India, uh, or even Mexico. Uh, so this is a new trend. Uh, I, th I think uh, China will also have to face that. Uh, so uh, uh, I think, again, coming back to what I just said, uh, the best strategy for every country, including China, is to find a niche in the global competition. Uh, as for the geopolitical uh, competition with U.S., uh, I think it's up to China, Chinese government to decide. Okay, one more question on China, and I will move on. Um, so this is, of course, the U.S. has come up with the, some of the toughest uh, export control regulations. But not only that, the U.S. has also managed to get some of the allied partners, whether it is the Netherlands or Japan and others, to come up with similar restrictions placed on China in terms of uh, export of semiconductor manufacturing equipment, tools, technology, and so on and so forth. So how is China coping up with this? How is China weathering it out, in a sense? The, how effective these are these measures at this point of time? How do you see that? Hmm. Um, there, there are two, uh, two times of uh, trial of Chinese government to uh, invest huge amount of money uh, uh, in developing uh, advanced semiconductor uh, industry. But the second one was uh, held back. Um, yes, semiconductor uh, is a capital-intensive industry, that's for sure. Uh, but again, uh, semiconductor industry, as I said, is a result of international collaboration. It's a globalized industry. We should always keep that in mind. Uh, for one country or one company uh, to be able to develop well in the environment of of global competition, the country or company needs partners. This is very important. No country can develop on its own. No company can do that either. Uh, um, so um, if, for example, China makes other companies or countries feel there are greater risks, naturally the companies will move out. Uh, China, after 20 years of development, has already developed pretty good ecosystem, I must say, including other ICT manufacturing, uh, a lot of uh, clusters uh, and uh, uh, science park uh, and uh, very convenient infrastructure. Uh, these are the still the strengths of, of China. So if China, uh, Chinese government is able to reduce uh, other countries worry about the geopolitical risks, um, China will still come back. Okay. Um, let me move to Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is the leader in terms of the semiconductor manufacturing. So how do you see the development of Taiwan's semiconductor prowess in the next 30 years, so to say? Uh, in that time frame, uh, how, do you see the, how do you see Taiwan's strength and if there are any weaknesses uh, in the semiconductor industry for Taiwan? How does Taiwan, in fact, sustain that edge in terms of semiconductor manufacturing? Nobody else has managed to do that. So how does, how does Taiwan maintain that particular edge and continue to do so? Um, I, I must say Taiwan, yes, Taiwan is a leading uh, player, leading role in the, in the global semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, but we are not good in, in other aspects. For example, uh, we uh, heavily uh, depend on uh, U.S. and uh, European companies for their innovation. Uh, and uh, we depend on European companies like ASML to provide equipment. And we depend on Japan for materials. So again, 
uh, we are uh, a good partner uh, with these uh, global uh, countries and companies. So that is the first strength of Taiwan. That, that is, we are open um, and reliable partner uh, globally. Uh, this is very important. Uh, this is a precondition. Uh, and uh, our companies are reliable partners for their customers and suppliers. Uh, and uh, that's the first thing. The second is uh, companies like, like TSMC or UMC, they're able to develop this fundry business model uh, upon which they develop uh, no competition relationship with their partners and suppliers uh, and customers. Um, therefore, they can work with anyone. That is a very successful business model. Um, so that's the second. The third, of course, the government, uh, Taiwanese government, no matter which party is in rule, always identifies uh, and values uh, this industry and uh, provide uh, very staunch support. And fourth, uh, Taiwan has has developed, like China, a very comprehensive uh, supply chain and ecosystem, uh, including uh, very good ICT manufacturing. Uh, the fifth is uh, we have Taiwan's a small island. We have developed pretty good infrastructure, uh, including water supply, a very stable electricity, uh, science park, and, uh, and transportation. Uh, and last but not least, is talent. Uh, we uh, have very good uh, STEM uh, students, uh, and uh, our students, uh, despite the best education they receive, they are willing to work in the semi-industry. It's a hardworking environment. They are willing to work in that environment. Uh, so putting all this together, I think these are the strengths uh, of, t of the Taiwan in the semiconductor industry. Uh, talking about the weakness, um, we are facing the same challenge, global challenge in the world. As I said, uh, there is always competition, uh, and uh, uh, South Korea is a very strong competitor, um, and uh, there are other competitors too. Uh, but as I said, we have our own very unique business model. Uh, and second, this uh, chip war, uh, like it or not, it is existential, and we have adapted to that. Terrific. Given that you talked about the strengths, as well as how do you look at uh, possible collaboration, um, so what, what are the different criteria or expectations when Taiwan looks at foreign collaboration? How do you, what, what do you, how do you make the case for uh, which country, which company, which government can you work with in the area of semiconductor manufacturing? Because given your strength, I'm sure there are plenty of countries who are waiting for a partnership with Taiwan. So what are the kind of expectations and criteria that you have in mind when you look at a foreign, possible foreign collaboration? Yeah, before uh, answer, <laughs> answering this question, of course, I have to say I'm working in the, in the think tank and the public sector. Uh, I don't work for any company, so I cannot speak for them. Uh, these uh, semiconductor companies in Taiwan, they're mainly private, and uh, despite government may have share in some of them, uh, but not in the dominant role. So uh, these, all these private companies, they, uh, they develop their own strategy. Uh, but from a, a, a government's perspective, um, the, the you're talking about the criteria. Um, yes, there, um, there are some facilitating, let me say, facilitating conditions. Uh, these conditions are pretty much the conditions I just mentioned about the strength of Taiwan. For example, first of all, we need uh, the, that country's government uh, to provide uh, strong and, uh, and, uh, and stable support, uh, in both in terms of policy and uh, 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 other developing development of infrastructure. And the second, which is equally, if not more important, uh, is the collaboration uh, of the customers uh, of the semiconductor industry. 
semiconductor industry, as I said, does not exist alone. It exists in the ecosystem. Uh, it, uh, it goes, the investments of in semiconductor industry goes to where the customers need it. This is important. It plays with market, uh, market driven. Uh, if there's a, such a strong market need, sometimes the government doesn't have to do anything to attract the investment. This is very, very, very important. Uh, and usually companies decide uh, based upon that kind of principle. And the third, of course, in infrastructure uh, and, uh, uh, and the last, talents. Uh, so the ecosystem and the, the business environment and the market-driven uh, uh, forces are, I think, uh, critical. Okay, I think we are almost getting there in terms of the time. But to wrap up, I want to ask you how does, uh, because India has been wanting to um, at least aimed in terms of gaining a fair share of the semiconductor manufacturing becoming a part of a hub. Uh, how does that project look like to you? Will Taiwan partner with India? How is already partnering, not partnering? What, are the, uh, what, what do you think in terms of the India project mm. on semiconductor? Yes. Uh, our government has been in very close contact with the Indian governments. Uh, two governments are <coughs> uh, both very zealous uh, about the p potential cooperation. Uh, <coughs> so that's that's one uh, one the, the first point. The second is uh, Indian governments and uh, your representative office in Taiwan uh, have been working very hard in approaching <coughs> uh, Taiwanese companies and uh, inviting these companies to come to India. Uh, so far as I understand, just in these two days, there, are, there is a very important Taiwanese company visiting here. Um, and uh, you have this uh, uh, initiative, uh, I forgot the PLI? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, <coughs> inviting global uh, investment, uh, providing uh, uh, different kind of incentive mechanisms. I think uh, <coughs> one Taiwanese company, Foxconn, has been working with some local partners uh, to compete for, uh, apply for that the, uh, uh, mechanism, and we don't know the result yet. So yes, Taiwanese government and companies uh, are involved uh, and has the willingness uh, uh, to be collaborative with uh, the Indian partners. Terrific, and uh, thank you so much for explaining the entire, the chips war as it is kind of uh, unfolding in a sense and where US and China are heading, and of course, uh, India and Taiwan can, what India, India and Taiwan can play, uh, what kind of a role uh, in this chips war. Thank you so much for uh, taking your time out uh, this morning to talk to us. Thank you. Really Pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Thank you.